And now, weighing in out of the blue corner, Josh the Pong Thompson. 100% agree. And on the other mic, he weighs in from the red corner, Big John McCarthy. All right, well, welcome to the Weighing In Podcast. The first thing I want to do is we had an unfortunate passing. Benji Raddick has passed away at the age of 45. Benji Raddick was one of the good guys of the sport. Super hard hitting, just an incredible person. When you got to know him, the kindest person you could ever meet. We're going to miss you, Benji. We are lucky enough to have the man, the voice, the guy that is the star of the UFC. I don't care what anyone says about Dana White. It's John Anik because everyone, I don't know anyone that doesn't love John Anik. We are lucky enough to have the man, the myth, the legend, <laughs> part of the Anik Florian podcast. I could go on and on. My man, how's it going? And <laughs> Good to have Getting you. Getting that intro from the consensus greatest mixed martial arts resource of all time is very humbling for a guy like me as I was researching Josh Thompson, your uh, your partner here today. I was just thinking, you know, for me, getting a call from a former major MMA world champion and big John McCarthy uh, is still a humbling thing. So I'm very excited to talk to you boys. Obviously, I've admired your work from afar and uh, we could do this for hours on end every oh, week. Yes. And that's why you guys always show up. So it's great to be with you. And thanks for the intro, my man. I love you, brother. John. John. <laughs> so, I, it, Which I John? Big, big, big John. Big, I'll oh, just shit. say Annie. Annie. You can call me Little John, whatever you need to do. Whatever you do. <laughs> big John said that there is something that's pinned up on your yours. Is it? Is it his no, or his? His wife's. His wife's. It's pinned, I guess, me on Joe Rogan. And, uh, and I was talking, talking about my man, Annick. Yep. Rogan and Josh were talking about your wife has it pinned. No way. I love that. Yeah. I had no so, idea. This is breaking news for me. How about that? Yeah. Thank you, Chrissy. <laughs> I can tell you follow your wife very closely on social media. <laughs> so She probably hasn't posted in half a decade. So that's a yeah, there you go. that she pinned oh, there that. There you go. There you go. Well, that, that's an and, old podcast. So it yeah, probably it is. It is. It is. <laughs> I, I believe that was in 20. I think it was right before COVID. 2020, right before COVID. End of February or beginning of February. Something like that. Right before COVID. Um, but look, I wasn't sure if you had heard and, and obviously if she had pinned it, but I got to get it out there. I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm going back to the, this, uh, the throwbacks where I've got to apologize for all of the mean things I've said to people. <laughs> I feel like I, I, we had, we had Kamaru Usman before, uh, uh, just a couple of days ago, it released this morning, uh, 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 but with you, look, it wasn't anything bad. It wasn't anything bad. Kamaru has more no, of a grace you than you'll ever stuff. have. You said you, at first. I was a little ruined. I think a little bit of it too. Let me ask you if you got this because I want to tie these two things together. Having to come into the UFC and kind of like replace Goldie, who everyone that's kind of what everyone had known. That's all we had known was Goldie pretty much. Um, what was it like having to do that? That's well, I think part. anytime you replace somebody who is an institution or somewhat larger than life, there is gonna be a little bit less of maybe an appetite for change. And I think Dana White was always reticent for there to be change. And that's why those guys called every UFC fight for a long time. Uh, but I wouldn't have left ESPN in 2011 if I didn't think eventually I could ascend to the number one yeah. seed and ideally work with Joe Rogan. I certainly believed in myself and my style and my preparation and my broadcasting chops up to that point in time even if i wasn't a lifelong martial artist but yeah i was freaking out for my first bellator show in 2009 boom they had hired the wrong guy i was freaking out a little bit less so believe it or not for my ufc debut in nashville tennessee in 2012 i think the most my heart rate ever got out of sorts was that first pay-per-view and thankfully daniel cormier uh talked me off the ledge on the way to Barclays Center in Brooklyn, New York that night. But uh, my approach hasn't changed. It's head down. Michael Bisping has told me to my face that he used to fucking hate me when I was on ESPN MMA <laughs> Live in the UK. So I've heard it all, and uh, it just comes with the territory, my man. So uh, no apology ever necessary. John, well, let, let me ask, you, let me ask you this as far as because I do remember you in the first season of Bellator as their play-by-play guy. You worked with uh, Jason Chambers. Chambers. That's right. And I apologize for that. So uh-huh. whoever did that, <laughs> I knew Jason well. But I remember you first. I want to say it was on ESPN MMA. It was MMA Hour, MMA Live. What was the name of that show? 
Yeah, ESPN MMA Live. Bisping would stay up with his wife, and they would like hate the piss out of me together. I think. I love. I love that. That's <laughs> yeah, the yeah, best. Yeah. But that's when I first heard you, and I was like, man, I don't know who this guy is. I go, but he's really good, and I and I'm I'm saying that because it's the truth. I go, he's actually really good. I go, but who the fuck is he? And he's huh. acting like he knows everything. No. <laughs> but it was. <laughs> You just grew on people. If there's one thing, and you know, he you talked about replacing goalie. Every on every play by play guy there is. I don't care who they are. I hear everyone, you know, the people that hate him, can't stand him. He doesn't know the sport. He doesn't. I never hear one person ever say they don't like you. You have got an aura about you that man, I'm telling you, you bow down to it. You have done an amazing fact because people give you credit. For knowing the sport, they never gave Goldie credit for anything. They thought he was, you know, absolutely wrong about everything. And I want people to know one thing. You deserve that because you've worked your ass off to know the sport. We used to sit down for coffee before shows and stuff when I was refereeing, which was a long time ago, obviously. But you worked your ass off to get where you're at, and you deserve every bit of the recognition that you now have. Well, thank you, buddy. I remember when I sought you out so you could explain to me how Dominic Cruz, I think, beat TJ Dillashaw, my now best friend in the sport, Dominic Cruz. And then how how did Carlos Condit lose to Robbie Lawler? I need you to explain that to me. Yep. But, yeah, I mean, a lot of it really has been rooted in hard work. And obviously hearing you say that is very flattering. And yes, maybe my public approval rating in 2024 is in a different place than it was in 2014. I remember that fateful night. At least Nashville. you got Bisping loving you now. I think a lot of my broadcast partners would say they love a lot of me, but I think I have a certain demanding nature to me. And, you know, Brian Sam was one of my first broadcast partners, and I showed up to have dinner with the guy two nights before one of our shows together. And he was like, oh, your fighter cards, you didn't bring your notes this time. I was like, oh, yeah, sorry, they're up in the room. He's like, dude, go get your fucking notes. You know, I was like, okay, yes, sir. Yes, <laughs> on my way. But no, I mean, a lot of, I used to sort of feel like everybody said, man, he, he works hard and he prepares. But I used to be like, well, is there any like television performance or broadcasting ability in there? Or is it just that I prep the fighters? But I know no other way. I am not a martial artist, right? This isn't in my wheelhouse necessarily the way the NFL would be. So Mm -hmm. yeah, like it's all hard work. Like I went to the Virgin Hotel to stay after Saudi Arabia. I ordered every single meal in the hotel room because I had the back-to-back. I had a big pay-per-view, the Hall of Fame. I'm devoting my life to this sport because I love it and the athletes deserve it. And the thought of having a major circumstance in Jesus Aguilar's life, you know, not cross my wake during fight week is enough to keep me up at night. So that's my approach. And um, yeah, I'm trying to create a, a gap for everybody trying to, you know, come take my job. Yeah. I've tried to explain to people how difficult it is to be the play by play person because oh. it's not, it's not just so much knowing about the fighters, but it's the lead ins, the lead outs of getting to and from TV. It's the commercial reads. It's the, you know, trying to get, trying to fit it in right in between a punch landing on how I can get that DraftKings ad read. You know what I mean? Like that's exactly what this is. Right. And it's, it's a timing and you've got someone in your ear the whole time. Okay. You have 10 seconds go. And then, you know, you say, you say your ad read or whatever it is you come off and then you're talking about the fight and now you got to toss it. Make sure you're involving you know, the color guys, you know, whether it's DC, Bisbing or whoever, you've got to, you've got to bring them into the conversation sometimes. Now, I know DC can just blabber out. I don't think time. he ever needs to bring Bisbing bring or DC. He, he oh, brings himself in it. just fine. Jeez. All 320 pounds of them. He brings himself right in. So, but, uh, but no, you know, what I, you understand what I'm saying, but there's, I remember, uh, and I've only had an opportunity to work with Moro and, and, uh, and Goldie and a couple of guys with uh, Sean Grandy as well. But I could hear them several times. I've walked down the ho- on, on the uh, hotel uh, hallways, and I could hear them rehearsing their intro, rehearsing. Like, the intro is the biggest part, right? Because there's so much going on in that intro. There's yeah. so much you're talking about, main event, co-main event, you know, yeah. trickling down what's your best fight of the night kind of thing. Um, there's so much. You want to make sure that you give those fans at home that intro that they deserve. And there's a lot of effort that goes into it. I remember one time I walked down the hall and I hear Goldie. He's got his door with little the little pin, you know, holding it open. Yeah. And you, I could hear him yelling all yeah. the way down the hall, you know, and yeah. it's, and just the intent and, he, and he'd mess up and then he'd start over ha. Yeah. and mess up and start over. Like he just yeah. kept, you know, but he kept doing it, kept pounding at home. I mean, you guys don't get enough respect. The play by play guys, women also, but you know, 
fellows well, out there, you guys, professionals, you guys are amazing to be honest. Well, thank you, man. No, that means a lot. And especially from you, uh, and considering the source that is you, because you have a lot of experience in this crazy television and broadcasting world. And yeah, a lot of my job has nothing to do with fighting. Right. And even if you look at the circumstance surrounding Danny gay stepping in for Brian Ortega, I have a producer in my ear. That's like, Hey, you're not going to talk for the rest of this round because I need to explain what is going on. Right. So there's a lot of things that go into it. And uh, yeah, we take the pay-per-view open very seriously. Oftentimes what you're hearing me or Goldie do in a hotel room is revoicing a fight. Either there's a pronunciation error that a producer didn't like, or maybe it's a new fight, right? That's been sort of the biggest uh, challenge for me is just 15 fights during COVID and then all the revoices and even like the Saudi Arabia show, I prepped Cedric with Dumas and Dennis Tululin and another fighter that never fought Kamzat Chimaev, right? So I end up prepping maybe, you know, 31 fighters for that show, even though 28 only fight. So it's a lot. And as my man, Brian Stan always said, like, it's an open book test. You might as well show up with some notes. And as great as that is, the preparation sometimes can sort of hover over you because you can't really over prepare. You can underutilize your information on the air, but you can't really, you know, show up with like too many bullets. So it's uh it's a little bit of a tricky challenge when it comes to like a work life balance. You've brought up Brian Stan quite a bit. I mean, I'm assuming you guys are really close and you guys continue to uh, stay in touch and uh you know, and what what was it like working with he's an amazing person, man. I, I can't say enough about him. Um I love everything about him, man. The guy yeah. stands for a lot of great yeah. things and he's yeah. just it seems like a great individual. It's like hard to find out. something that Brian Stan is yeah. bad at or you go, Oh, he's not a good guy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I used to spend a lot more time with him, obviously, than I do now. And he's the greatest leader I've ever met. Elite human being doesn't even begin to describe it. But I think his contribution wasn't gonna be broad enough with the UFC. And I think with respect to my craft sports broadcasting he's just too capable. And mm -hmm. I would have said that before he got his executive MBA. So I think unless he was going to be Dana's right hand man and running the whole company and really affecting change in his way, he's not going to do it. And I think part of the reason he wouldn't go into politics is because so much compromise is involved, depending right. on what state you're in, just to try to get the seat that would get you to the oval and knowing Stan, if there's no path to the Oval or being President Stan, I don't think he's going to try to become a senator in the state of Georgia. Dude, I'd so, vote for him right now. Yeah, no, <laughs> the man has uh, an absolute ton to offer. And, uh, you know, I know if anything really goes sideways in my life, uh, what a resource. And by the way, I will tell you, like, I'd be like, hey, man, if you make a run to the Oval, can I be your chief of staff? And he's like, absolutely not. You're not qualified, <laughs> not qualified. He's you're like, you can be the press secretary, like you're a great orator, whatever the fuck. But yeah, chief of staff, absolutely not. <laughs> he's just totally called you he's like no no actually no, no you can't, actually no. cannot be that person you, you crazy <laughs> press John, secretary I'll... though bet us america's favorite sports book and casino live betting and race book we're celebrating 30 years with a historic offer a 125 percent sign up bonus on your first three deposits plus 10 percent gambler's insurance get started today bet us where the game begins i want to ask you this because you've done all kinds of voiceover stuff and things throughout your time with the UFC I've done those kind of things but you did one and it was I want to say it was about Habib Nurmagomedov's dad Abdul Mata. have you ever done one that meant I and maybe it's you know different but it seemed like to me listening to you man you were part of that thing you made it you made it have a heart you made it freaking live you made it so it was epic. I, I, I've always looked at that one thing that you did, and it's the greatest voiceover of something of that magnitude that I've ever listened to. And I want to commend you on it, but you, is, the, is that the number one that you can think of? Yes. I mean, the only thing that even comes close and same producer no longer with the UFC, Mike Ricci, now actually working for chess.com, and my daughter's along with Daniel Cormier's daughter, got to do an Amanda Nunes essay. So it was those three girls doing it. So it had nothing to do with me. I don't know that anything could top that. But man, yes, you're giving me chills when you reference that poem, A Father to His Son. I wish yep. I remember what it was. But oftentimes when we do an essay for a fighter, I might write it. I might have a ghostwriter, and then I might edit that script. In this case, it was this poem that was actually picked. And I really had to find 
And I appreciate you acknowledging the work because I am proud of it. I had to find sort of a, a dulcet, almost melancholy, sad tone that is very – and it was voiced on this exact headset that you're looking at right now in a hotel room probably like this, right? So finding the right tone and sending that off, hoping that they would put it together in the right way. Yes, it was special, and obviously it was to him. But Mike Ricci really deserves all the credit, right? Uh, I mean, my twin brother could voice the fucking thing, Johnny. No, no he could not. <laughs> um, but no, yes, I mean, I, I'm i very thankful for all the different experiences that have come my way. But that was particularly special. And it is outside of my skill set a little bit. Like, I am a little bit of a lunatic. And when I have to host the UFC Hall of Fame ceremony once a year and slow down my cadence and come out and look at all of my MMA contemporaries, I'm kind of freaking out back there. Whereas when I'm doing a Conor McGregor pay-per-view, pay-per-view it's like, let's go. Yeah. yeah, there's an energy, right? You try to bring that excitement to a pay-per-view, but then when you actually have to get in front of the mic and actually speak so people can understand in a slower tempo, like I guess the best way to explain it is when you're on air, uh, not everything can be in an 11. You've got to set the tempo like it, when there's something exciting. Otherwise, if everything's in an 11, then you don't know when something really is exciting is going on. And you've got to separate that sometimes. You just go, ah, you know, he's doing a great job of just, you know, sticking the jab, sticking the jab. If everything's always like, oh, the fucking jab is the greatest thing in the world. And, just, and then if it's yeah, that yeah, way, yeah. then there, you don't know when a nice hard shot lands and it's fun to talk. You know, it's excitement. To, the crowd needs to be excited about it. So, yeah. Um, you know, I want to like, I'm, I'm still going to, I want to go back a little bit and I more care more because I, like, I, I honestly, in terms of your work, I hear you all the time. I enjoy your work. But I kind of nerd out on, on some of the past stuff. I want to know like about the Brian Stan relationship, but I want to know about the Kenny Florian relationship. How did mm. that start? Like what, what, what uh, makes you guys so close? Well, you know, it's a little bit sad that he's no longer my UFC broadcast partner because if I didn't believe in him analytically to the extent to which I do, I wouldn't have built a podcast around him in 2015. And... He's a very layered individual. He is a much nicer human being inherently than I am. You know, we used to call him K-Swiss at ESPN because he was Switzerland, right? He didn't like to necessarily pick fights and pick against his contemporaries. But I met him at Mock Delagrati's gym in Somerville, Massachusetts. What an absolute pit mark. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Ceilings were low. It was low. Yeah. Uh, but I met Kenny. And, Ceilings are yeah, right there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, but we love Delagrati. But no, Kenny just, I, I mean, it sounds trite, but he did light up the room with his smile in his rash guard even then and he was my broadcast partner on MMA Live dating to 2008 and you know my emotional investment in his career was bigger than probably anybody's other than maybe Dom or DC I don't know I mean when DC was doing what he was doing we were exceedingly close 2018 19 yeah. 20 and all of that but uh yeah, I put Ken Flo on a pedestal uh, because there's a nasty prick in there, even though we talk about just his relatively soft disposition uh, as a fighter. He was anything but. So I love Ken Flo. Uh, I do hope to crack a professional mic with him in a non-podcast setting at some point in the future. And, uh, you know, I give him a lot of credit for sticking by the podcast because it hasn't always paid him as much as the, the robot fighting and other initiatives have. So <laughs> That's crazy, right? Who would have thought, right? Like one day I'm flipping through channels and I see him on the robot fighting thing. And I'm like, wait, holy, I knew I recognized uh, that voice. What the yeah. hell? So, but look, I've always been a big fan of Ken Flo. And, um, you know, uh, he just, I think he's been a great fighter for so many years. And just coming up the way he did through the, the Ultimate Fighter and then coming on and having having two different weight classes that he had three, basically, right? Well, 85 was the, the Ultimate yeah. Fighter was 85. Yeah. 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 He was at 70. Yeah, he had, had to put rocks in his pockets. And 45. Yeah. He was at 45 yeah. also too. He went to 45. Yeah, he went to 45. Yeah, staring yeah. death Jeez. in the face. They're holding Keith Florian back, trying to take his brother out of the sauna. It's the oh, only time man. Keith really, uh, you know, didn't come through for Team Florian, right, as the vice president of Team Florian. We needed Keith to get Kenny out of the sauna. I remember being at a company party for my wife at the end of the school year in June in Vancouver, thinking, like, dude, this guy may pass away on weigh-in day. Like, what are we doing here? What man. the fuck? This you is know, what we so. do, man. Yeah, dude. I wish and I could hey, explain I mean, it a little bit well, better. Well, no, and but... one thing that he doesn't have, you know, he has so much amazing thing, but he doesn't have a major MMA lightweight championship like yeah. yourself. And 155 pounds uh, will always be put on a pedestal by me as the best division one through 30. So, uh, yeah, I mean, he accomplished a lot. 
He's, say, Jesus, say that one more John, time. Say that John, one more time, John, Annick. Do you want, say it one do you want more to just time. make anything I worse here? I want John to hear you say that one more time. Go well, ahead. sorry for all the swearing. You know, my mother really is imploring me to not swear on the Anakin Florian podcast, but it's hard for me to maybe flow without that word. So if it is indeed okay. this terrible verbal crush. You can crush, swear here. Yes, 155 pounds. Bantamweight is trendy. Right? Wow, it's good right now. Featherweight, with respect, I don't want to have that conversation. Uh, 70, strong as an ox, mm -hmm. but I think Bantamweight is much more trendy. Lightweight is far more historic. You know, one thing about lightweight that we don't necessarily have Keep it coming. Keep is it coming. an obvious greatest lightweight of all time. But yeah. my gosh, the top 40 now, previously in Josh's prime, that's it. They're great, man. I mean, you listen. Yeah, you know, I go all the way back to BJ Penn, you know. But I mean, I'll say BJ Penn, and but yeah. the, what ruined? I wouldn't say ruined it. Just what keeps him off that greatest of all time in the in the 155 pound weight class is just he fought everybody. He fought Lyoto Machida at 220. You know, he's fought uh, Henzo and Rodrigo, and he fought guys that were never in his weight class. So when I look at the losses, I'm like. Ah. But if he would have stayed at 55 and just really focused on being the best and the greatest ever in that weight class, instead of just doing what he wanted and fighting all the other guys out there who had the biggest names. But then back then, he had to chase the big names. He wanted to prove to everyone he was the best jujitsu guy in the world at the time, beating the Gracies and doing what he could yeah. to beat Gomi in Hawaii in his own promotion. Like Those are things that he historically just wanted to do to pave the way to be like, look, I can do it with or without any promotion. doesn't matter. Yeah. And he yeah. proved it. But then when he came back, you know, it just he still fought at 70. He should have been fighting at 55. He took that time, and there was a lot that was going on. But, I mean, the guys that are in there, you got Islam right now, but then Habib, you know, and there's other, you know, 55-pounders that are in there. But those are, to me, the top three, I think, right now, the 155-pound yeah. division, I think, ever in the world it's yeah. since the weight class has come back. So, um, John, would you disagree? Anik, would you disagree? No, I think that's fair. I mean, prize fighting is tricky, right, because George St. Pierre strategically – made different decisions than Alexander Volkanovsky did, right? Like, let's say Volk was just too undersized to make 55, and his greatest aspiration was to leave Jose Aldo and Max Holloway in the dust. You know, maybe his career plays out a little bit differently, and most people do believe that Volk is still the greatest featherweight of all time, you know, but he opened that up for conversation. Yes, I begin it with BJ Penn. You know, Kenny Florian, unfortunately, had to fight the best version of BJ Penn. Yeah. But as long as that conversation begins with BJ, I'm pretty okay with uh, – with Islam Akashev and Khabib Nurmagomedov and, uh, and really any other name, uh, 55 is just not, doesn't have a clear top three, like 45, I guess. There's no one that's ever no. defended that belt more than three times. Yeah. It's, it's a rough one, you know, and that's going back all the way to Jens Pulver was the first 155 pound champion in the UFC. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, from that point, you know, it's just, and it is because, you know, there's so many reasons why, but it's, the level of talent in that weight class is impressive. Say it again. Except, ha! well, Josh Josh Thompson <laughs> is definitely not uh, one of those people no, that had okay, that talent. It's okay. It's okay. I get it. I get it. <laughs> but, but it is the level of talent with across the board. And, you know, we say it all the time. When you get to this point, and, and I want your opinion on this, we talked to Kamaru Usman, and he, I thought he said it just beautifully. Uh, because we try to tell people all the time, look, at when you are – the challenger, you have that target to put your sights on. You have that, you, you know, you get laser focused on it. You're going to training and you're doing these things to build up to that person. While you're that person, you're the champion. You not only have now you're the target, it's tough for you to have the focus on one person. And it's also, you have so many requirements of you now by the UFC. And it's look at that's part of being the champion is you you have to go to things you have to go to media days you have to go to these you know you know get to know this person the signings for this every day that you are doing that you are not in the gym training yeah, right you're not even staying as good yeah you're not getting better and you're yeah. not staying as good while someone's getting better yeah and it makes it where it's you know it's understandable why it's so hard to hold on to that title this sport's just crazy, and I'm so fighter-focused in my mind that I'm sitting in my hotel room trying to 
craft the perfect message to Steve Urseg after he gets knocked out by Kai Kata France. And I try to lean into like the positives more than the negatives, but just everything that comes with winning and losing one mixed martial arts fight and the consequence of that. And if I could just go back to 55 pounds for one second and bring Mataj Gamrod into this conversation, he had won eight of nine going into the Dan Hooker fight. I thought it was a very tough fight fighting him there in that type of environment. Absolutely. And I don't know the extent to which Mataj Gamrod has realized financial freedom. He won two KSW titles, right? But he may never fight for the title right now. And he backed up for Makashev and Volkanovsky, right? Yep. So it's just a very, very difficult sport to obtain a number at 55 is so difficult. And uh, yeah, just all credit to the fighters. I do hope that 25 years down the line, the number 15 ranked 155 pound fighter in the world you know, I was making a million bucks to show because uh, that's progress. Whether you're an Olympic athlete, professional hockey player, MMA world champion, or just an active kid, Element helps anyone stay hydrated. Each stick pack delivers a meaningful dose of electrolytes free of sugar, artificial colors, or other dodgy ingredients. Get your free sample pack with any Element drink mix purchase through link in bio. Also try the new Element Sparkling, a bold 16 ounce can of sparkling electrolyte water. Roll, train, ride, or play, but stay hydrated and stay salty. I mean, but you've got to, you, you also know that they've come a long way since my departure in the sport. And even when I was champion 2008, 2009, 2010, like it's come a long way. Yeah. The amount of money we were making back then. And I've said this a bunch of times, Sean Shirk was the champion at UFC and I was the champion in, in strike force and I was making more money than him. Yeah. And it just, right. and that was not, and you are considered to be the biggest promotion in the world. Things have obviously changed, you know, a lot since then, but I'm saying, but at that Still time, right. yeah, there was, there was no reason for me to be making more money than him. They were yeah. the bigger promotion. They had, you know, they had all the, the money at their fingertips and I, I couldn't understand that. Everyone kept asking me, why don't you go to the UFC? And I was like, there's no reason to. And I was yeah. like, yeah, but we get backroom bonuses. Yeah, but that's at their, that's at their discretion. You yeah. may never get one. Yeah. You know, and so that's what scared me the most. And, uh, and, and no, this is no dig at the UFC. They've actually come so far you know, in the last, you know, 10 years or so. I mean, it's, it's insane to see how much these guys are breaking in now. And it's still not to the level that we, most of us feel like they should be. Well, and the tricky thing too, is if you take just one prelim fighter and I should probably come up with a different name than my man, Jesus Aguilar, right? But <laughs> a guy who fights the first fight of the night, you know, what is his relative worth to the UFC? How much money is he bringing into them relative to how much they're paying yeah. him. So there's so many cases where it's just beyond generosity and the athletes are compensated way more than they're actually making the company money. For me, it's just selfishly wanting mixed martial arts to maybe be in the United States what it is in Australia, because my gosh, I just got back from Perth and let's just say uh, the fighters and people like me are a lot bigger deal over there than they are mm -hmm. in America. So while we've realized a lot of progress when it comes to television, and I know Everything comes down to TV and the money and everything else. But, you know, I want to live in a world where my bottom line is flashing that, you know, Mataj Gamrot signed a five year, $15 million deal at $3 million a fight because I think Mataj Gamrot is better than the average, you know, ninth man on an NBA team, you know? So that's yeah. where a lot of it, you know, I've been a, a beneficiary of the UFC's generosity, like many of my colleagues have. I'm just saying, I want the sport to be right there with the NFL. I don't want to be competing with the NHL. Sorry to the Canadian listeners. <laughs> I, I'm a firm believer though. And I've said this to, to many people and I've said it in our podcast multiple times is that it will get there. It's just going to take baby steps. I think everyone's like, Oh, they should make 50% right now. No guys, we didn't get to the percentage of 18, 19% that we're at now, like overnight, it's going to take 10, 15, I think another 10, 15 years. We'll start seeing that 28 closer to 30% because I think the UFC right now is on track to just start, I mean, they're just a worldwide sport now. I think also too growing more into the Middle East, growing more over to the UK market. Yeah. Like they're hitting everywhere. You're going to see them in every country. And that being said, that's going to start opening the, the percentages a lot more. 
but everyone wants it right now. That's the American way. We we want. I see it. I want it. I gotta have it. Put myself yep, in debt. You're right. Just do it. Screw it. You're and right. I feel like the UFC is taking a very strategic approach, although it's very slow to fighters who are suffering right now, or they're not suffering, but they would like to get paid more. There is a future though for uh, that I believe and I see in that you know somewhere in that four, 35% range i think i don't know where it'll do after that but i think it'll get up to that 30 percent, 35 percent. but it's going to take at least another 20 years well and it doesn't behoove me to get into some long-winded conversation of course about fighter pay and i'm very <laughs> <concerned>. sorry, <laughs> no, sorry. No, no, hey. yeah no i tell people before i go on the air it's up to me not to perjure myself but i'm very happy with the progress we have made yes and i shouldn't even say we because it's not we but i'm very pr- proud of the progress that mixed martial arts has made and i have devoted my professional life to it so whatever tiny part i've had in helping drive it on tv as far back as 2007 internally in bristol connecticut at espn to where we are now 17 years later as a sport tremendous you know i guess i wish i was a little bit younger josh you know so that uh i could you know be around for uh just the absolute boom but it's starting obviously what's what's really cool and i know i'm going a little long here colleges and fraternity houses right can you imagine like if we were having watch parties for the ufc the way yeah. they're doing now in college it would have been the greatest not that college wasn't great but can you imagine there these kids are literally doing 30 ufc watch parties a mm-hmm. year on saturday yeah. their whole college experience revolves around the ufc it's amazing I do remember that they were trying to do it in some of the local colleges in the Bay area and they were allowing them to happen. And then, but then their biggest concern was that they would, it would lead to an escalate to fights. And I'm like, you're literally have people at fraternities and sororities falling out of windows because they're pissed drunk. So what's the wrong with them sitting on the couch until 11 o'clock at night, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night, watching a sport. Maybe they drink, maybe they don't. I don't know. I mean, but it just, it would just seem so ass backwards to be honest oh my god they get in a fight that's horrible (laughs) oh no (laughs) but i even in western australia meeting with some of the folks from the uh tourism board uh i'm still fighting for this sport right as you guys are on a day-to-day basis when it comes to the superficial nature of the violence and how much the face bleeds and uh i like still having these conversations actually the passion is still there to try to explain to this lady that um American football is a true car crash on every every play. And if you watched me watching the NFL, yeah. I act like I'm watching fatality after fatality. <laughs> I'm like, oh, my God, how is he alive? And I call mixed martial arts for a living. So, Well, I live in Texas now, and I got to be honest, a lot of the parents here have been very, very stern about the fact that they don't let their kids play until sixth, seventh grade uh with with uh full contact football. so everything yeah. right now yeah, yeah, yeah. is 7v7 or flag football they're not they're not doing tackle right now until about the seventh grade yeah you know That's which is crazy because football here is so, is no, gospel but this <laughs> is like knowledge helps and and over time you hopefully get smarter about how things are and you know it's part of like when you were talking about ursig and and we talk about volkanovsky and people like that and josh and i talk all the time about he needs time off and Volkanovski kept on saying, oh, I want to fight more. I want to fight. It's like, he, no, well, you need to rest. Yeah. And there's guys out there like, you know, and I'll say it. The guy who is in a car crash every fight is Justin Gaethje. But he takes the time off between fights to get himself in the best condition he can be as far as giving his brain time to recover and all these things that we've learned over time. There's things that you can do to help. Yes. And all those things need to be done. And, you know, Dominic Cruz does a lot of things, right, to, for his body and his mind that go underreported or unreported. But there is work, absolutely, John, as you well know, that you can do on your brain to improve your yep. actual brain health. I mean, Dom has to spar so much to get himself ready for these fights that if he wasn't doing the brain work, you know, he wouldn't be sharp as a fucking tack. Wayne, nope. you're, go ahead, John. No, I'm, it's fine. When you're when you're calling guys like when you're calling guys, what's going through your mind? Let's say a Justin Gaethje fight, and I'm going to give you because you said you were doing a little bit of research, going back and looking at you, the old fight between Tony Ferguson and myself. What was going through your mind watching that car crash? You know, and I mean, you watch the Justin <laughs> Gaethje, you watch the Josh Thomas to get his ass kicked by Tony. Like what's like really? I want to know what's going through the play by play person. Please, mind. please answer that, and then tell us your feelings about. <laughs> no, I'm serious about what you've seen Tony go through now because it's a similar thing and it just happens 
based upon every fighter ends up going through that cycle. Yeah, this sport is absolutely nuts. And I guess the only thing that I could equate it to in terms of what I feel going through my body before Max Holloway fights Justin Gaethje is if the New England Patriots were playing in the Super Bowl, right? Like I feel this tremendous anxiety and tension and excitement as a sports fan. And it's not because I have a a dog in the fight, right? Oftentimes I have connected tissue and interpersonal relationships on both sides of it. But when Bilal Muhammad is trying to change his life in his one shot against Leon Edwards, or Leon Edwards has 90 seconds to change his life against Kamara Usman, these sporting events are so consequential. Like it's, it shouldn't be lost on NFL fans when I say 14 major sporting events a year, the Super Bowl and the 13 UFC pay-per-views. That's what they feel like for me. So yes, with everything that comes with my job and all of the things that have to do, nothing to do with fighting about my job, there is nothing quite like the preamble to these big fights, uh, if that answered your question. The energy, though, calling a fight like a Justin Gaethje with yeah. uh, like Michael Johnson or any of the guys that you see him watch, Eddie Alvarez. Yeah. You feel that excitement, you feel that energy, but then knowing them personally, do you, I mean, the conversations like we, John and I talked to these guys afterwards and I, I want to remind people that they're, they're still human. I think yeah. we, yeah. if you go online after man, it's just a cesspool of toxicity of just people saying, ah, oh, he's a fucking bum. He's this, yeah. I'm like, you just watched one of the greatest fighters of all time, whether it's yeah. Justin Gaethje, whether it's Tony Ferguson, whether it's yeah. Kamaru Usman, like and even Kamara brought this up in our interview. It's like, yeah, everyone just calls you washed. Like once you lose one, it's like, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I think I've heard you say this before is that they, they basically MMA fans are very toxic. Well, I mean, I would say not a week goes by where somebody doesn't talk to me about, uh, mentioning a custody battle on live television. Right. So certainly there are things that were judged by every utterance, but it's much harder being the professional athlete and being the actual man in the arena. And I feel like I've been a resource for a lot of fighters, Joe Pfeiffer, Bruno Silva. Uh, I think they feel like there's a certain approachability there and I'm certainly happy to be able to, uh, to provide that service. But, you know, Tony Ferguson's a very special case for me and not just because of our lightweight conversation, uh, but just based upon the context of his winning streak and what it meant at 155 pounds. And it ties into Gamrod a little bit and just how hard it is to make the walk and fight for the undisputed UFC lightweight championship. And Tony Ferguson never did that, which is just systematically insane. Now I have no pull when it comes to the UFC hall of fame, uh, you know, but I would lose my job, you know, popping veins out of my neck to try to state his case, even though he didn't win the ultimate prize, uh, you know, and I've had a front row seat for it. And I, I love hearing you as one of his former opponents refer to him as an all time great because, uh, you know, I hope he'll still be acknowledged as such. Well, I've, I like I trained with Habib for years. Like I was actually one of his main training partners, getting him ready for the Tony Ferguson fight on those multiple occasions that never came to fruition. But <clears throat> It's hard not to, it's hard to look past Tony Ferguson and be like, Hey, he's good here. He's, and even though I shared the cage with him, I knew he was good before that. I knew that he was someone that he had a chin on him. He had a beard on him. He could take a shot, but he was also very crafty on the ground very creative on the feet. Um, and when you're dealing with someone who has that amount of cardio and conditioning and is willing to walk through your shots. And if you do take them down, understands. I don't need to stay here, but I can stay here. Those are the ones that give you the biggest problems. And um, I, I'm, on, I'm, on the, I'm on the fence a little bit about the Hall of Fame, but I'm also right there saying he is one of the greats, Yeah, especially in the toughest weight class ever. That's the thing. That's the hardest part is to do what he did in the toughest weight class in the sport. Yeah, I mean, the Hall of Fame is uh, is tricky. We have the four yeah. wings. We do the best I can. I've hosted it for like 13 years, but it is certainly imperfect, right? Because it would seem as though Jim Miller's work is going to be acknowledged in the Hall of Fame. And if Jim Miller gets into the modern era wing of the Hall of Fame and Tony Ferguson does not, that would not appear to make any sort of... Uh, Tony well, Ferguson we, deserves well, to be in the UFC's Hall of Fame. Well, then we There's, riot. <laughs> Not a doubt. We're we're we're, we're well, going to battle Thompson on that one. Josh Thompson deserves yeah. to be in the mixed martial arts Hall of Fame that ceases to exist. I mean, where are we? I mean, John McCarthy. How many Hall of Fames are you in? I mean, where you know what I mean? Two. Right. See. But you know what I it love, means? Yeah. Nothing. Right. No. Yeah, well, I mean, of course. No. I mean, happens. I tell Mark Ratner, like, dude, could you save some Hall of Fames for the rest of us? Mark. You know? <laughs> exactly. John, my my last question is this for you: is 
you've been part of the UFC, you've been part of the sport of mixed martial arts, and you are an incredibly knowledgeable person. What is it that if you, if I could grant you that power, that you could make a change in the sport of mixed martial arts, what would you change if you would change anything? Off the top of my head, it would be to give judges more resources, so it would be to give judges half points. And I can oh, stand upon that if you want. But I love it. That's really it. I think judges need more resources. And there are far greater authorities than me when it comes to other ways to affect change as far as that is concerned. But based upon my conversations with judges, if you could just give them, give them half points and the ability to use half points, we would have a lot more clarity when it comes to how these rounds actually play out. The half point system, I think, is a must. It should come to fruition here, hopefully, as soon as possible. But it won't. I would love to see it because yeah. I think it would make it as it would make the fights a lot more interesting as well. I mean, it may take them another 15, 20 minutes to tally up the scores because math is probably not their strong suit, but we <laughs> right, can figure right, it out. Right. <laughs> I guess I'm going to leave you with this. Um, there's two parts to this question, though. The first part is, what is your favorite fight you were ever part able to call? Well, I remember when Mark Hunt fought Antonio Bigfoot Silva in Brisbane, Australia yeah. in 2013 Great fight. at whatever hour of the morning it was over there. It didn't feel like a lot of people were watching back home. And I just felt like, dude, like, I know I'm an amateur. I know I don't know the difference between a Darson and an Anaconda and a fucking Bravo choke. But if that wasn't the greatest live sporting event I've ever seen, I don't know what was. When Rose Namajunas knocked out Ioana Jacek and oh. even Zhang Wei Li, those two moments, right? She beat both those bitches twice. I mean, so I, I, I don't, I don't yeah. even know what else needs to be said. There have been a lot of incredible, incredible moments. But shout out to the lead horse, Mark Hunt. <laughs> and then my last one will be if you could pick one or two dream fights that you would love to call. They, they could actually happen. Not, let's not make up fairy tales. Let's talk about ones that you realize that, and they may potentially be able to happen. You'd be able to call. Well, I mean, certainly Shavkat Rachmanov and Ian Machado Gary, I thought they would fight as undefeated fighters before they got to a championship opportunity. I don't necessarily think that is going to happen. But my dream fights are all within division for the most part, right? They don't involve guys jumping around, you know, even though maybe I would like to see in a pinch, right? Sean Strickland maybe fight for a BMF belt at 85 in Salt Lake City if they couldn't have gotten a Lex Pineda. You know, I think they could get creative. I used to be. I wouldn't say I was ever anti-BMF belt, right? But largely, I'm pro-interim championship when the undisputed champion can't make the walk. And I'm pro-hardware for these fighters who deserve to be acknowledged. I can't believe how pro-BMF championship I am relative to what my first ingestion was of that. So, a lot of it for me is like Armand Sarugyan and Islam Akashev and seeing Islam stay at 55 and really maybe exit as the greatest lightweight of all time. I do want to see Leon and Izzy fight, even though Tim Simpson hates me. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, I'm very happy for Bilal Muhammad. And the one thing that they know is that he is going to fight all of these guys. And if they want him to fight Jack Della Maddalena because, you know, it's better for them that Jack is the champion, then he'll go to Perth and fight him there, you know? Yeah. So. And what are the chances I can uh, get you to persuade Kenny Florian to come on this show? Anything? Oh, dude. Are you <laughs> I love Kenny, I mean, man. I just, I would love to get a hold of him and reach out. I sent him a text probably about, I don't know, three months ago. And I haven't heard back from him. Oh, so. yeah. No, well, I'll make that connection. You know, I, I don't know if Ken it. flows like Joe Rogan having to change his cell phone all the time, but Kenny's okay. a pretty secretive guy. You know, he'll be like, oh, I was shooting this morning. I'll be like, pistols or TV? Like, what were you <laughs> doing? You know? So, but yes, we'll make that connection and, uh, yeah, that'll be good to reconnect to the greatest lightweights of all time. So I appreciate John, him, my man. John, I want to tell you, thank you so much for your time. You are the gold standard of how to play by play an MMA fight. You are fantastic. And I want to thank you for being my friend. Thank you for the shout out you gave me the other night and everything. You are <laughs> a good at. man. <laughs> Thank you for being there. And even in that it's moment, okay. I got the rules printed out. I know you've hammered it into my head that, yes, when a fighter is screaming as if they're giving birth, the fight is over. But uh, <laughs> thankful to have your support, especially on the air. And uh, Always. the one thing I will say in closing is that, and this is the truth, I am a diehard sports fan, and I don't pay an attention to the announcers a lot, right, unless they get in the way of the sporting event. Mm. And we're on for eight hours instead of three. 
So we're trying to be as listenable as possible. As Josh suggests, leaving room in your register for the bigger moments, not getting in the way of the experience. So when people like you, who I put on a pedestal, suggest that we maybe add to the experience a little bit, you know, that's all that uh, we ever want to hear. So thank you for, uh, for having me. And uh, hopefully Kevlo does bigger numbers than me on your program. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, uh, thank you so much for your time. Ladies and gentlemen, the one and only Mr. John Anik.